right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. And if you haven't been with us, we have been in this series called What Child Is This? Where what we've been doing is looking at these Old Testament symbols in the New Testament nativity story. And these are details. Uh, sometimes they're obvious, sometimes they're easy to overlook, but these are details in the story that are meant to show us the bigger thing that God is up to. Details that are foreshadowing Jesus and who this child is. Now, this week as we continue, I really wanted to pick up right where we left off last week. And if you missed us last week, we spent some time in Luke chapter 1. This is the birth story of John the Baptist. And, and we, were, we were looking at these details that Luke uses that give us a very, very clear timeline for the birth of Jesus. And then we went to some detail looking at why that was significant. Now, if you missed us, I'm going to do a little bit of a recap just to make sure we're all on the same page. Because again, we're going to pick up right where we left off last week. And so in Luke 1 verse 5, we see that Zechariah, who's the father of John the Baptist, was from the priestly division of Abijah. And the reason that was important to us is we know according to Jewish history that the priestly division of Abijah served at the end of May. So May 15th through May 30th, somewhere in that window. And the reason this is important is because as we go through the story, we see that Zechariah serves in the temple. He has this encounter with the angel who says, you're going to be a father and that your child is going to lead all of these people to God. And then immediately after he gets back in verse 24, we see that his wife, Elizabeth, gets pregnant. Now, if he served in May, at the end of May, then we talked about how it's probably a fair assumption to say that she got pregnant, she conceived sometime in June. And the reason that's important, again, we're just connecting a bunch of dots. The reason that's important is because in verse 26, and it's repeated in verse 36, we see that Mary, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Mary has this encounter with Gabriel. And Gabriel comes to her and says, you are going to give birth to a child, and that child will be Jesus, the Savior of the world. And so we did some quick math and said, well, if she conceived in June, and then you take six months from there, that leads us to December. That that conversation that Mary has with the angel probably happened in the month of December. Now, the reason this is significant is one of the things that we see all throughout the New Testament is that God is going to use the festivals of Israel as a way of pointing at the bigger thing that he's doing. And there's actually a great example that we saw last week. And so we asked the question, were there any festivals, any Jewish holidays that happen in the month of December? Well, Hanukkah, right? Hanukkah's right around the corner. It's a little bit late this year, but it's right around the corner. Hanukkah is the festival of lights, which is interesting because one of the things Jesus says about himself is, I am the light of the world. Could it be the light of the world was conceived during the festival of lights? And so we spent some time talking about that last week. Now, again, I want to pick up right where we left off. And one of the things, I had a lot of people come up to me afterwards and say, okay, Brian, wait, let me get this straight. If Jesus was conceived in December, then that means there's absolutely no way that he could have been born in December when we usually celebrate Christmas. And I always feel like a Grinch whenever I teach this, but I, I, it's biblical, so I have to, right? Uh, you're absolutely right. There's, there's no biblical evidence whatsoever that Jesus was born in December. But I promise you, when we look at the details and connect the dots, what God is doing here with the birth of Jesus is so much better. And so what I want to do is just a little bit of quick math, right? If Jesus was conceived in December, then that means, if you count off nine months, that Jesus was likely born sometime probably towards the end of September, if not maybe the beginning of October, if, you know, babies don't always come when they're supposed to arrive, right? Sometimes that happens. And so probably in the end of September or the beginning of October, which for us, we need to ask the question, are there any significant festivals on the Jewish calendar that happen at the end of September? And would you believe it? There is one. I, I know you're shocked. You never saw this coming. Right there at the end of September, the very beginning of October, is the Feast of 
Sukkot. Now, if you're not familiar with Sukkot, it goes by a lot of different names, the Festival of Tabernacles, the Festival of Booths, or the Festival of Tents. Uh, This was a time when Israel would build these temporary shelters, think like shacks or huts, right? These temporary shelters outside, and they would live in them for seven days, and they would celebrate. And they would celebrate a couple of different things. One of the things that they would celebrate, and this wasn't the original reason they started it. This was a tradition that kind of got picked up along the way. But one of the reasons they would celebrate is they would celebrate the beginning of the raining season. Again, they're living in an agricultural society. And when you're growing your own food, you kind of need water, right? I mean, I didn't do well in science, but the one thing I know is that plants need two things, water and sunlight. And so what would happen is again, this festival takes place, usually the raining season begins at the very end of October, and so this festival is taking place right at the beginning of when that raining season would start. And so what they would do is they would come together and they would pray that God would give them rain, and then you're going to love this. And then they would celebrate. And when I say they would celebrate, I mean celebrate. It was a festival, right? It was a party. I think a lot of times in church world, when we think about celebrating, we get very humble, very somber, right? We don't want to get too loud. We don't want to get too rowdy. Neighbors might notice. And you don't want them complaining. But when they would celebrate Sukkot, they would celebrate. And in fact, according to Jewish writings, the noise of the celebration in Jerusalem could be heard for miles away. Think about that for a minute. This is a world before amplifiers or air horns or anything like that. They were celebrating so hard that people could hear it for miles away. But what's even better is they were celebrating not what God did, but what God was going to do. You see, the reason they were celebrating this is because they prayed for rain. And they knew that God was going to give them rain. And so they were going to celebrate, they were going to party because they prayed and they knew that God was going to show up, that God was up to something. They were celebrating what God was going to do. By the way, could you imagine how much different church would be if we had that mentality? If we didn't just celebrate the things that God did in the past, but we get excited about what God was up to. If when we prayed about things like how God was going to use us to reach our community, Could you imagine if we started to celebrate because we prayed and we knew that God was going to show up? I'm telling you, that would be a game changer. And so one of the reasons they celebrate Sukkot is they were celebrating this idea that God was about to do something. Hold on to that. Because there was another reason they celebrated. And the reason they celebrated was because they would remember. Remember the time when they were wandering in the wilderness, right? The exodus has just happened. And they're going from place to place to place in the desert. They're living in these temporary shelters. All the while, God is providing their needs, manna, that bread, and then water. But at the very center of the camp, wherever they went, was the tabernacle of God. That for them was the actual dwelling place, the, the house of God. They believed that God lived there right in the middle of the people. Which means when they celebrate Sukkot, part of what they're remembering, part of what they're celebrating is a time when God lived with their people. Please tell me you see the connection here. Please tell me you see where this is going. Could it be that Jesus, God himself, came to earth to live with his people during a time when God's people are, first of all, they're expecting God to move, right? But could it be God lived with his people during a time when they're celebrating God living with his people? I love this because part of what this shows us is that God is trying to make himself as obvious as possible. You see, sometimes I think we develop this mentality that God's like 
trying to trick us or trying to like give us all these little hints and clues and puzzles and make us think as if he's trying to be all mysterious. And what I love about this is when we begin to understand their culture, when we especially begin to learn to understand the festivals and those sort of things, God's not being sneaky. He's being obvious. He's trying to make this as obvious as possible and show us exactly what he's doing. God lives with his people during the time when they celebrate God living with his people. And in fact, what I want to do with the rest of our time today is look at a passage out of this nativity scene where we see more evidence for this idea of Sukkot. And so if you've got your Bible, do me a favor, turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Last week we were in Luke 1, we're going to be in Luke 2. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we should have one in the chair in front of you. If you've got one of those, we're going to be on page 857. Again, that's page 800. And 57. And while you're turning there, we're going to look at a really, really famous story out of this nativity scene. This is one that most of us, if not all of us, are going to be familiar with. Uh, if you grew up in church world, I promise you know this story. Uh, this is one that we just hear every single year at Christmas time. Even if you're here today and you're not really a church person, I'm willing to bet you know this one. In fact, a uh, little bit of a spoiler maybe. Uh, if you've ever seen Charlie Brown Christmas, you know this story. And in fact, I'm willing to bet when I read it, and you're reading it to yourself, you're going to hear it in Linus's voice, right? Like, you guys know this story. So again, we are in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse 8. It says this, And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by Night. Now, I want to stop there really quick, and, and there's a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. Uh, first of all is, is kind of a disclaimer. I want you to notice that you have these shepherds that are out in the fields, right? Whenever we think about shepherds, for the vast majority of us, how we usually tend to think about like older guys with beards, right? I mean, if we're going to stereotype shepherds, that's the picture we have. Like these older dudes, maybe 30s or 40s, maybe even 50s, and they've got these big, long Gandalf-like beards. And like, this is just what they do. That's who they are. The problem is that's not very historically accurate. And in fact, if you look at their culture, what you see is that shepherds were, the job of the shepherd, I'll say it like this, the job or the role of the shepherd was usually reserved for the lowest or the youngest member of the family, which means shepherds were children. And in fact, you see this, you remember the story of David? Before David and Goliath, you have David who was a shepherd boy. And in fact, there's this great story in Samuel where Samuel is looking for the next king of Israel. God leads them to Jesse's house. And so Samuel goes up to Jesse and says, hey, I need to see all of your sons. And so he brings all of them out except for David. And the reason he forgets David is because David is the lowest. He's out in the, she out in the shepherding, uh, he's, he's out in the fields. He's just kind of doing his own thing. Like, surely he doesn't need him. He's not important. He's the lowest member of the family. And so the job of the shepherd, again, it was often reserved for that lowest member. By the way, because it was a male-dominated world, that means that usually shepherds were little girls. And so when we read this story, I think it's important that we understand that this whole scene happens with children, and not like older guys who, who have all of these years of experience. And so you have shepherds. And then I want you to notice that they're out in the fields. Believe it or not, this one little phrase is actually very key to giving us this timeline that Luke is picking up on. Because shepherds would only allow their sheep in the fields during certain times of year. They weren't always in the field. In fact, usually shepherds left their sheep or led their sheep into the pastures. And if you were with us when we did that barren series last month, we talked about that, didn't we? We talked about green pastures and what that looks like. That usually the shepherds would lead their sheep into the pastures. But when the harvest came, well, that's when the shepherds were trying to get into the fields. Now, the problem was if shepherds get their sheep into the fields too early, the sheep eat all the food. 
And you don't want that because that's people food, right? Like we need that food. The sheep don't need that food as badly as as we do. And so the rabbis developed these add-on laws. Remember we've been talking about the add-on laws that they would have? One of those laws was that shepherds were not allowed to lead their sheep into the fields until after the second Sabbath, after the, uh, the, uh, the harvest started. Words are hard today. So two weeks after the harvest started, which if you are somebody and you have to have like clear, like definite dates to help you remember things, a good way to remember this is Ju- uh, July 1st. By July 1st, they were usually allowed in the fields, and that would last till the raining season. Again, the raining season, mid to end of October, and so if you need hard dates, November 1st would be a good one. And so from July till November, the very beginning of November, that was the window that sheep were allowed in the fields. By the way, according to that rabbinic law, if a sheep got in before those two weeks, it had to be stoned to death. I'm sorry, wow. (laughs) But it's harsh, but that was their world. And so because it was so hard, we know that that timeline, when it says he's out in the field, is reliable. And so that timeline, though, fits perfectly with our idea that this story happens during Sukkot. Now there's one more thing I want to show you in this story. Look at this. Verse 9 goes on. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear, which makes sense, right? I mean, they're kids. Could you imagine? I mean, I would freak out if I was in the field and angels came up, let alone children, right? They're terrified. They're scared. Verse 10, the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. By the way, we'll talk about that one next week. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is well pleased. By the way, I think a better translation of that is peace on earth to all men. uh, First of all, it's a more accurate translation. But but what's more uh, interesting is that verse 14, that song that the angels sing. It's not just any song. That song, believe it or not, comes directly out of Sukkot liturgy. It would be like singing Christmas songs during Christmas time. Are you with me? Which makes sense. You've got these children, and they're scared, and they're terrified. And the angels, part of what they're doing is foreshadowing what's happening. But part of what they're doing is they're trying to calm them down by singing songs that they would have been familiar with. And so again, over and over and over, everything that we see points to this idea that Jesus was born during the feast of Sukkot. It goes on, verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning, um, concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Again, over and over and over, what we see is this idea that Jesus was born during the feast of Sukkot. But there's something interesting that kind of comes out of this story, and I don't know if it jumped out to you guys or not. But I think it's interesting that as we go through this story, we see that shepherds play such a big role. Isn't that interesting? Like, if you were God, and you were going to announce the birth of Jesus, I wonder how many of us really would have picked shepherds 
Because shepherds were kind of forgotten about people, weren't they? They were the lowest and the youngest member of the family. A lot of times people will talk about shepherds as if they were outcasts. And yeah, I mean, kind of, sort of. They weren't as outcasts as like Samaritans and some of the others. But they were definitely people that were often forgotten about. And so the question I want to ask is, why in the world does, does God put a spotlight on the shepherds as we go through this story. And one of the things that I think is interesting about this is as you go through the Old Testament, what you see over and over and over is that one of the ways we see God being described is a shepherd. And in fact, several weeks ago, we looked at Psalm 23, and that is all about God being a shepherd in our lives. We talked about Psalm 40 again. God is a shepherd. He leads us out of the muck and the mire and puts us on the solid rock. Over and over and over, we see this image in this picture that God is a shepherd. And we see shepherds highlighted here. Again, shepherd, shepherd. Notice what Jesus says about himself. In John 10, verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. You see, not only, not only is God showing up during Sukkot, but Jesus himself is going to be a shepherd for his people. He says, I am the good shepherd. Now, believe it or not, there were actually good and bad shepherds in their world, right? It's kind of like if you go to work, you've got good employees and, and not so good employees. We don't want to say bad but we're thinking it. You would have good shepherds and bad shepherds. And one of the easiest way to tell the difference between a good shepherd and a bad shepherd is a good shepherd was willing to die for their sheep. And in fact, how many of you remember several weeks ago when we walked through part of the 23rd Psalm? One of the things that we talked about in verse four, it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, now, if you weren't with us, we looked at a picture of the valley of the shadow of death. It was this really, really deep, dark valley. Even in the middle of the day, you've got like darkness there because it's so deep. And one of the things that we talked about that deep, dark valley is that it was extremely dangerous. And in fact, shepherds would almost never lead their sheep through those valleys because it was like a hunting ground for predators. By the way, the predators in their world were uh, leopards, bears, lions, foxes, and wolves. These were real threats in their world, and they loved these valleys because they were natural bottlenecks. But sometimes the shepherd had to go through, and sometimes one of those animals would come up on them, and they would have to do something. They would have to make a decision. What am I going to do? Am I going to stay and fight for the life of my sheep? Or am I going to run and save myself? Notice what it says as it goes on. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with, more, with me. And then it says, my rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now the rod and the staff were two of the major tools that a shepherd had. By the way, with the rod, kind of an unspoken part of that was the sling. And if you remember the story of David and Goliath, that's exactly what we're talking about. And we don't have time to get into that one, but that's kind of an interesting thing in itself. But the rod and the staff. Now, the rod was what the shepherd would use mainly to defend itself against predators. And I want you to think about this. The rod was a two-foot-long club. Think about like a baseball bat, right? Two foot long. It, it, it had metal and rock that was embedded in the end of it. So if any animal came up, they would have the opportunity to try to defend it, himself with this giant club. Now, the shepherd, understand this, would never, 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 never beat his sheep with that club. It was only for predators, but again, the shepherd had to be willing to risk his life to defend his sheep. And that's exactly what we see in Jesus. That as we go through the life and the ministry of Jesus, we see that like the shepherd, Jesus himself was willing to lay down his life so that we could be set free. That he was willing to take on death on a cross so that we could be set free from our sins. 
Because again, we look at the story, Jesus had the power to walk away. He could have left us, but he loved us enough that he was willing to lay down his life and die for us so that we could be set free from our sin, from our shame, from the mess and the junk in our life and free to step into a relationship with him. Jesus was the good shepherd because he was willing to die to set us free. But then we see the staff. Now the staff was kind of that typical thing you guys think of whenever you think of a shepherd's staff, right? That five foot long, it's got the hook on the end, right? That's what we usually think about. And that was used mainly for guiding. Now, sometimes it was used to rescue their sheep. Uh, several weeks ago, we talked about the wadis, those dried riverbeds that occasionally you would get these flash floods. And when the floodwaters came, you would have this thick mud underneath that was left. And often sheep would go down there and get stuck in there. So the shepherd would take that stick and use it to hook around them and pull them out of that mud. And so sometimes it was used for rescue, but a lot of times it was just used for guiding. And one of the ways the shepherds would guide was just very gently by tapping its sheep whenever they got off course. You see, the thing about sheep, and I relate to this, by the way. Sheep are ADD. Sheep are easily distracted. How many of you are with me on that one, yeah? Right? Like, I see something, for example, it's snowing outside, and and several times as we've been going, I'm just like, hey, it's snowing. Oh, look at that, it's snowing. I have really bad ADD. Sheep are the same way. By the way, everybody's looking outside now. (laughs) That's what I get. Sheep are the same way. And if the sheep are with the group and they see something, they're naturally just going to be like squirrel. They're just going to head off in the other direction. That's just what they do. They're not very bright. And so the shepherd will just come alongside them, take that staff and just kind of tap them. Not hard. Again, never beating their sheep. They would just tap them redirect them and bring them back in the line. And so the staff is one of the ways that the shepherd is going to lead his sheep, but there's another way. And that's the voice of the shepherd. That the shepherd will train these sheep to recognize their voice. And in fact, I had a uh, small group leader way back when Megan and I first got married. So this has been, you know, 17-ish years ago now. We had this small group leader who actually grew up in the Middle East And so he reads the Bible and he brings all of this cultural context. And one of the things that he talks about is just this idea of shepherds and the sheep recognizing the voice. And he tells this story about you'll have all these shepherds, like three or four shepherds in a field. And all their sheep, I want you to picture this, they're all mixed up together. Now, I don't know about you. That gives me a little bit of anxiety. Anybody else? Because I'm thinking to myself, I want to get my sheep back. Like, I don't want to end up with somebody else's sheep. Because I know Shepherd Steve. I know the way he treats his sheep, and I don't treat my sheep that way. And so I want to make sure I get my sheep back. That would give me anxiety. And so these shepherds will stand around, they'll talk together for a while, and then it's time to leave. you got to go home, right? And so one of the shepherds will walk off a little ways and call. And all their sheep will just start following him. And then another one will go off the other way and call. And all their sheep will just go follow them this way. It's crazy. You have these sheep that recognize the shepherd's voice. John 10, 27, Jesus says this. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they will follow me. You see, Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus laid down his life so that we could be set free from our sins and step into a relationship with him. And for some of us that are here today, we're at different stages in this journey. For some of us, we're being introduced to Jesus for the first time and we need to have a conversation about what it means to follow Jesus. And I would love to have that conversation with you afterwards. But for some of us, we're here today and we've already chosen to follow Jesus And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, do we recognize the voice of our shepherd? Are we willing to hear him 
throughout all the other voices, all the other distractions of life. Because we live in a world of distraction. And it's easy, it's easy for us to get so distracted by all the other things that are happening that we cannot hear the voice of God from all the other voices that are speaking into our lives. And so I got a couple of questions as we wrap up. First of all, can you identify the voice of God from all the other voices that are speaking into your life? And I talk about this a lot and I talk about it a lot because I think it's important. The number one way I'm telling you to learn to identify God's voice in your life is by diving into the scriptures. Because the Bible is not only history. Yes, it is history, but it's not just history. When we read the scriptures, we're reading the very heart, the very nature of God. We begin to see the things that God cares about, the things that God is passionate about, the opportunities that are in front of us when we say, hey, I think God would do something about it. Again, we talked about this last week. Maybe that's God's way of saying, yeah, maybe somebody should. Maybe you should. See, the scriptures is one of the most important opportunities that we have to learn to hear the voice of God in our life. And so the question I really want to ask us as we wrap up is what is he calling you to do? Because God's calling all of us to do something. Again, all of us were created with intention. All of us were created with purpose and design. We are all being called to do something. What is God calling you to do this season? What are the opportunities? This is actually one of the things I've been praying big time about Redeemer. What is God calling us to do as a community? How can we begin to make a difference and an impact in the neighborhoods around us? I want you to imagine this. What if we as a church became intentional about serving somewhere in Omaha. Because when we talk about serving Omaha, that's a big area. But what if we began to pray together as a church about a specific area and said, God, where do you want us to serve? How can we impact your kingdom the most by zeroing in on a given area? What if we really began to pray about that and then looked for the opportunities to dive in, looked for the opportunities to serve the world around us because last week we talked a lot about being a light to the world. In order to be a light to the world, we've got to step into action. See, I believe that God is calling Redeemer to make a difference and we've got to start somewhere. And so one of the things that I'm praying about and I ask that you would pray with me is where's God calling us to serve so that we can make a difference? Because as we do, I think you're going to see God do some incredible things in the lives of the people around us. I think you are going to see God begin to move in ways that we only hear about and read about. I think God wants to use Redeemer. And so will you pray with me this season as we start to look at next year? about the opportunities that God's going to put in front of us. And can we celebrate? Because when we pray about something, God has a habit of showing up. And imagine how different our prayer life would be if we began to celebrate what we're praying about because we know that God's going to honor that, that God's going to be with us as we begin to move with him into the future. Again, Are we open to the voice of God speaking in our life? And are we willing to say yes? Let me pray for us. God, I thank you so much for today. Again, for the sweet voices we heard this morning. For a warm place to worship you on a snowy, gross day. God, I just pray that you'd be with us as individuals, that you would show us where you're calling us, what you're calling us to do, how you're calling us to make a difference in the world. God, help us to be people that are about your word so that we can begin to hear and understand your voice, to recognize your voice from all the other voices that are speaking into our lives.
But God, more than that, help us to not just hear your voice, help us to act on your voice so that people can see you in and through our lives. God, thank you for today. Thank you that you are faithful. God, thankful. Thank you that you never leave us hanging, that you meet us, that you meet us on the journey, that you are the good shepherd. First in Jesus' name I pray.